Okay, so we're off. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, get to know our Bibles a bit better. Obviously, we already know our Bibles fairly well, but this is a useful moment, I think, to spend some time thinking about what we know about our Bibles, but also, if we can, adding to our knowledge, uh, unearthing old, old memories of our Bibles, just getting a, a clearer overview. Um, so I'm going to start this morning by thinking about the book of Genesis. We may be talking about what we already know, but that's fine. If you have any questions, I think you know what to do. So we, we, you can put questions to me. I can ask you at the end, okay? We're aiming for about half an hour. <clears throat> but if we need to, anybody needs to kind of get up and walk about or, or leave, that's absolutely fine. So let's think about our Bibles then and getting to know our Bibles. And uh, we're going to, as I say, look at the book of Genesis. But surprisingly, let's start in 2 Timothy and chapter 3 and verse 16. So if you've got your Bibles there, let's all take a quick look at uh, 2 Timothy and uh, chapter 3 and verse 16. So we're in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. So Paul is writing to Timothy and he's reminding Timothy that he has known the Holy Scriptures since childhood. And in verse 15 he says that the Scriptures are able to make us wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then we get verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So when we are saying we're getting to know our Bibles, what we are getting to know is that which has been given to us by inspiration of God. We are not do dealing with any um, ordinary book. Um, part of the great tragedy of the Christian church is that we have subjected the Bible to the same treatment that we would any other book, as if it was simply a, a man-made, uh, man-originated document. What we have here is a wonderful word that you only find in this place in the Bible, uh, inspiration of God. It's one word in the Greek. And it's made up of the word God, theos, and the word wind, um, pneu, or, or we get pneumatic from. So scripture is that which God has blown, or, or God has breathed out. Um, and we, so we, we are dealing with um, a word, a writing, that has come directly from God himself. He has blown out if you like, his word, uh, men then, and women, I guess, have received that breath of God, and they have um, put that breath into written form. Now, that's what we are dealing with. It's God's revelation to us of his mind, of his character, of his purposes, um, of his desires, his plans, and it is directly breathed out from him. The, this word breathed is used by Jesus uh, when he meets Nicodemus. And he talks about uh, the wind blowing uh, as it wishes. You hear the sound of it and you see the, the, the trees bending in the wind. That's exactly the idea that we have when it comes to our scriptures. Uh, it is that very breath of God which bends um, the minds of men, just as the wind bends the trees, the branches, the leaves, you see the effect of the wind upon the trees. So God's breath has come upon the minds, the hearts, the hands, the experiences of men, molded them, moved them, bended them, so that they then write for us uh, those, those words. So that's what we're dealing with. That's the scriptures. Hebrews reminds us that we have uh, a spoken word. Uh, the prophets in times past spoke as they were inspired by God. We have the living word, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. And then, of course, we have the written word, uh, which is our scripture. Scripture simply means writings. 
we have the writings then which is the word of god so that's what we're dealing with so we we deal with the bible with reverence uh, and we also come to our bibles in dependence upon god you and i are not able to make any sense at all of uh, the bible unless the, the, the same God who breathed it out and moved the minds of men and women uh, helps us to understand the scripture. So let's ask God to bless us as we turn to his word. Let's pray then. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have breathed out and, and we have the effects of that uh, in our Bibles. We have your word, we have your revelation. And uh, as we turn to it this morning, we ask you to help us understand it. We ask you to bless us as we study it together and may it feed us, our God, uh, and may we grow in grace and in the knowledge of yeah, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for all your goodness to us and we continue to look to you in these difficult times. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's turn to the very first book then, and uh, it's the book of Genesis. And I wonder how many of you remember, I'm sure you do, that whilst we tend to think about Genesis as a, a book about creation, uh, we also tend to think about Genesis as um, the beginnings. The actual theme of the book of Genesis are fathers and sons. And what you have in the book of Genesis are 10 stories about fathers and sons. And each story, do you remember, it's introduced with the words, this is the history of, this is the genealogy of, uh, this is the account of. And what you get then is a father's name, and then you get the name of a son, or you get the name of creation or whatever it is. So we've got 10 father-son stories. So I'm going to take my time and just outline for you where the 10 stories are so that you can find them. So that's a bit laborious when um, I'm doing the talking and you're going to have to look through the book. But I'll take, uh, you know, take it slowly to give you the, the um, 10 separate stories. And out of those 10 stories, we've got three big stories, three stories that stand out in the book of Genesis that uh, we are meant to pay particular attention to. So if you've got your Bibles there, then let's all take a look at Genesis. And the first thing you've got, which is exactly what you would expect, is an introduction. So Genesis 1 verse 1 down as far as Genesis 2 and verse 3 is our introduction. And the introduction tells uh, the first time, the first account of uh, creation and it's summed up in Genesis 2 and verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his works, which God had created and made. So there's the end of our introduction. The stage is set. A home has been made uh, for God's highest creation, which is uh, man. And uh, we have this perfect scene in which man will be in fellowship with God in the home that God has made. And of course, what we know is that man loses that home. And the entire rest of the Bible is, uh, can be thought of as how God seeks to find a new home for man. And uh, he rehomes humanity um, as a result of his son, Jesus Christ. So there's your introduction. And our first narrative, then the first story, starts at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4 and there's your formula so take a look at verse 4 and you see the words that introduce every one of the 10 stories verse 4 this is the history of this is the story of the genealogy of so here's story number one genesis 2 verse 4 and the first story uh, extends to chapter 4 of genesis and verse 26 Story number one, this is the history of the heavens and the earth uh, when they were created in the days that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So the first story, the father-son theme is God the father and the son, if you like, is the, the account of creation. Then we meet Adam 
So Adam is the first son uh, that we come into contact with. And of course, the first story has the theme of the lost son. God loses his son, Adam, through Adam's disobedience. Uh, that father-son relationship is broken. And that broken relationship then uh, becomes the, the uh, narrative for the whole experience of humanity. Humanity now lives in a broken relationship uh, with God, just as um, we'll go on in the story to see how Adam loses his own son. Adam has two sons, Cain and Abel, and of course Abel, who's the um, righteous son, he's killed, so Adam loses his son. So can you see how the, the first story works? Is God with creation. In creation is the first son, Adam. That father-son relationship is broken. And that break is then reflected in Adam losing his son, Abel. That's a mirror, if you like of what has happened between Adam and God. So this first story, set in a perfect scene, is a tragic story of broken relationships. But then, right at the end of this first story, and it's wonderful, you get the idea of a new son. So take a look at Genesis 4 and verses 25 and 26. Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. So do you see the hope there? Adam and God's relationship was broken. Adam lost Abel, but he was a new son. And this new son uh, is the, the, the beginning of a sense of hope, renewal. Um, the work isn't over. Father's sons haven't come to an end. There's a second son, a new son, and he also has a son. And when the writer puts that lovely phrase right at the end of this first story, then my men began to call on the name of the Lord. You've got this idea of sons and hope and restoration and renewal and continuity. So, First story, sad, loss, but then hope, renewal, second sons, the story continues. There's your first narrative. Now I'm going to keep an eye on the time. If we don't go through all 10 narratives today, we'll carry on with it tomorrow. Let's take a look at our second narrative. So as you know then, the second narrative begins in chapter 5 and verse 1. You've got that familiar introduction. This is the book of, this is the history of, this is the genealogy of Adam. So our second story is the story of Adam, and it's his history. You get a recap, and then you've got the uh, lineage of Adam. And as you'd expect, I, guys, the, the story of Adam, Adam's son, in this second narrative, is um, Noah. We're going to come to the idea of, of Noah. And again, it's very similar to the first story. The story begins sadly. It begins with the wickedness of human beings. So look at chapter 6 of Genesis uh, and verses 1 down to 6. Here's the, the idea that wickedness is increasing. Um, God is sorry that he's made man. And there's this idea of, of judgment, as we kind of talked about yesterday. The wickedness is great. The thoughts of man's heart was evil continually. But then in all this gloom and, and horror, you get Noah. So take a look at chapter 6. And right at the end of uh, verse 8, we get Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So by now then, you're getting the idea that these narratives, father-son narratives, may well begin tragically, but then you get the note of hope at the end. So just to recap, the first narrative, God and Adam begins tragically, but then there's a replacement son. Here in the second narrative, increase of wickedness, men's hearts are evil, but then you have Noah. 
and you have that idea of grace in the eyes of Noah. There's your second narrative. So, all okay so far? Take a deep breath. Let's take a look at our third story. So, chapter 6 of Genesis, and down as far as uh, verse 9, and choose our third story. Uh, Genesis 6 verse 9, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Now, those of you who are very, um, uh, your spiritual antennae are working well, you'll note that what I just said a minute ago seems to be contradicted. Here is a third story that begins optimistically, not tragically like the first two. Look at how we are introduced to Noah. Noah walked with God. And you've got this uh, idea of uh, a story beginning well. You've got the uh, history of Noah here. And you get straight away Noah's three sons. You can see it in verse 10. Uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And uh, what the, the author of, of Genesis will start to do, he'll start to play with the theme of fathers and sons. And we're going to start to think about, out of the sons of the fathers, which son is going to stand out? Which son will continue the story? Um, which is the favoured son? Um, God is going to start to make promises. And this is the first story in which God will make uh, a covenantal promise. And then you'll start to think about, okay, how will that promise be fulfilled? Which son will it be? Is it the firstborn? Will it be the secondborn? Will it be the best son? Is it going to be the wicked son? And, and this is starting to um, be woven into the, the stories of the fathers and sons uh, in the book of Genesis. So here's our third story then. Um, it's Noah, it's the ark, it's the flood, and it's the story of the covenant with creation. So take a look. Uh, through the, the chapters and the story of Noah, this third story extends to the end of chapter 9. So let me recap. Third story, Genesis 6 verse 9, and it extends right to the end of chapter 9. So quite a lengthy story, and in this story you have the flood, you have the ark, you have the covenant with creation. And just to remind ourselves of that covenant, take a look at it. It's Genesis 8 and verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and night and day shall not cease. I don't know whether we've thought much about the covenant uh, with creation in the light of climate change, all the, the news that we've had in recent months. We've had the floods here, we've had fires in Australia, so much emphasis about uh, climate and the need to be careful of our world. Um, I guess as Christians, we could think about that in the light of uh, God's creation um, with uh, God's covenant with creation. Um, but it's very interesting, isn't it, that here we have God's commitment to the ongoing um, life rhythm cycle of, of creation. We get the idea of the rainbow in the cloud, you remember, as uh, the sign of the covenant. So just a word now about uh, covenants. Covenants are an agreement between God and one other. So here's God's agreement with nature, with creation. Every covenant, has signs, and here the rainbow is the, the sign of that covenantal agreement. And uh, this is our story with, with Noah. And as you look down, you uh, meet Noah and his sons again in chapter 9, and uh, verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It's a, a repetition of these three names because these three guys are going to be important as uh, the book of Genesis unfolds and uh, you get this 
third story ending at the end of chapter nine. Okay, so far, I've got Tracy and William sitting next to me and they're all um, <clears throat> kind of giving me messages. So I really can't tell what's going on there. Let's, let's ignore them. Can I just check with you? Are you all okay? You've done three stories. We've got about nine minutes left. Let's do story number four. So the fourth narrative starts at uh, chapter uh, 10 and it's verse one. So let's take a look at that. Genesis 10 verse one. Now this is the genealogy of, this is the history of the sons of Noah. So you get Shem, Ham and Japheth. We've met them already. Here they are again. And what this story does is it tells us um, about what happens to each of the three sons. And the three sons go in different directions. Um, and as you look at um, Genesis 10 verse 2, we start dealing with the sons in reverse order. Genesis 10 verse 2, we've got Japheth, who's the youngest. And he and his line go off to become uh, the coastal peoples. Uh, so following the flood, when this is the only family in the earth, uh, the youngest son goes off and he becomes the father of all the coastal nations. Then you get um, Ham and his descendants and they seem to go off in another direction, the opposite direction. And he becomes the father of, of the Eastern peoples, I guess. And then we come to Shem, the firstborn. So this narrative is the narrative really of Shem. So for those of you who like your words, Shem uh, becomes the father of the uh, Semites, um, the, the people from whom God will choose the Israelites. So when we use the word anti-Semitic, the Semitic part is um, descended from Shem. So Shem will be the one whom God will bring his people from. And uh, we get the story of Shem in Genesis 10 and verse 22. So you can see there, this is the sons of Shem were. And as you follow them down, go to verse 24, and you get the son called Eber. Can you see him in verse 24? This is Genesis 10, verse 24. Arphaxad begot Salah. Salah begot Eber. Now guess what, guys? Think of your words. If Shem is Semitic, the Shemites, Semites. What do you think Eber is then? What word that we are very familiar with do you think we get from the son Eber? Any ideas? I'm sure you've worked it out. From Eber, we get the word Hebrew. So we are meeting the Semites and we are meeting the Hebrews. The Hebrews are descendants of Eber. The same root word there for his name is then applied uh, to the Hebrew people. And uh, as we follow uh, Eber and his descendants down, we get the story of the Tower of Babel. And again, this is a, a, a narrative. This fourth narrative um, is a, a, it's a, a sad narrative. You've got uh, the common language, you've got common culture, You've got the oneness of the human race at this time, and that oneness leads to an attempt to be greater than God. So you've got the building of the Tower of Babel, and then you've got the judgment of God upon that, and then you've got the division of human experience into nations, separate cultures, separate languages. And uh, you've got the idea of this narrative ending uh, the period of universalism. The human race has been dealt with as one up until this point, and then down comes God, crashes down the Tower of Babel, divides humanity into separate nations, separate languages. That division, whilst an act of judgment, is also for the good of humanity, and this is the moment then when the Bible starts to focus its attention away from human experience in general and onto one particular family, and that family will become the people of God. Those of you with good memories will remember that this Babel moment, this moment of division and separation, 
is reversed in the book of Acts when we come to chapter 2 and we've got the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is when God unites humanity again through the gift of the Spirit, through the speaking of tongues, we get oneness again. And then from Acts 2, we get the whole story of God dealing with humanity in general. So Genesis 1 to 11, humanity in general. Genesis 11, 12 onwards, right through the Old Testament, God focuses attention on the Israelites or what will become the Israelites and his chosen people right through to the book of Acts and then day of Pentecost, God widens again his attention. God widens his purposes. God has brought a new unity. Willow's barking there. God has got a new unity, a new human oneness and most wonderful of all, that human oneness is through the church. It's going to be safe this time. Oneness is going to be, unity is going to be established this time through the church, the new covenant people based on the Lord Jesus Christ. So this fourth story then, the story of Babel, the story of Shem, the story of Eber, comes to an end in Genesis 11 and verse 9. And then our fifth story, let's end here for this morning, our fifth story starts at Genesis 11 and verse 10. This is the genealogy of Shem. So the Semite people. So there we go, guys. The first four stories. We're up to story number five. Let's pick this up tomorrow. Um, I'm going to bring it to a close there. Um, just remember then, book of Genesis, father sons. And it's about that relationship, beginning with the original father, God, father of creation, broken father-son relationships, renewed father-son relationships, hope in the son, the choosing of one particular son from which the people of God will come. And of course, woven into this narrative, we'll begin to see themes developing and, uh, and the story of an ultimate son whom God promises. And this ultimate son will be the, the one through whom all the world will be blessed and all the world will be saved. So I hope that was okay. Thank you for listening. Let me just end the recording. Stop recording.